Well, this is a great time of the year, and uh, you know the, the message we're going to look at today, um, one of the songs that we'll be singing, I'm sure, it, at some point is Emmanuel, God with us. And uh, before we get into soul Christmas sermons and messages, I wanted to kind of add a couple more of Ephesians, because this next one actually talks about Christ in us, and that's what the, the, the message revolves around, what Paul is getting at. And so we're going to take a look at that. But uh, one of the things I wanted to do first was, was ask the question of, uh, last week we, we looked at the question of how do we overcome some of the enemies that we fight against in our lives. But this week I want to ask the question, who cares? Why should we? What, what's the point? What's the big deal? What if we don't overcome our enemies? I mean, a lot of Christians don't. A lot of Christians like kind of half do and half don't. So, so what's the big deal? What does it really matter I would like to look at this week? You know, it, the, the common thought in today is, well, if you're not hurting anyone else, what does it matter what you really do or don't do? Now, I know the biblical answer by thinking, well, because God says so or because the Bible tells us to do this or to not do that. But again, who cares? I mean, Christians all the time kind of half do things. So, so what does it really matter? I mean, you know, we're kind of a lot of times half committed to things and half committed to other things. And so what does it really matter? Or does it matter? You know, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, we know that God's not pleased. But, yeah, you know, what does it really ultimately matter? Because we do it anyway, right? We, 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 that's just the way our lives tend to go. So I want to look at that. I mean, you know, why not pursue, you know, a, a career and put everything into that? Why not pursue or, or do things on, say, a date? You know, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate? Why, well, why not, you know, get close, as, close to the line as possible? You know, why not drink as much as you want to drink and eat as much as you want to eat? You know, why give your time to church and to ministry? I mean, why would we do that? You know, everybody gives a little bit. You know, we all give a little bit. And, uh, you know, we might give, uh, you know, and work in the, the, uh, the, the coffee bar and do some things like that. You know, but then again, we're kind of here anyway. So, yes, we need those people who are doing those kinds of things. But what about why give in a, in a way that it's kind of sacrificial and it kind of digs into some free time that you really would rather be doing some things that you're interested in. Why? Why would we do that? Or, or the same kind of question with money. You know, we all give and, you know, we're going to pass the offering plate where we, pass a, we did pass the offering plate. We all give a little bit. But why would we give beyond a little bit. You know, why would we give a tithe? You know, a tithe is 10%. And you start thinking, boy, you see 10%. Now, is that after or before taxes? But even after taxes, that's still a chunk of change. Why would I do that? I mean, I'll give a little bit, but, but 10%? Really? Well, what about, and we can go on and on and on. The question is, why? Why would we do those things? And we're going to answer that today. Now, like I said, last week we asked the question, can we realistically defeat some of the big enemies that we have in our lives? And we looked at four of them. Uh, we looked at the flesh, you know, just our natural desires to do things and not do things, our, our natural, natural fleshly desires. You know, we all have those, and that's an enemy. That's something that kind of wants us to do the wrong thing. And then we have the demonic forces. We looked at that, that, you know, the devil and, and, and demo demons are right there tempting us and helping us to uh, rationalize certain things. We looked at the world system, you know, the whole fact that like all of our friends and all of our work people and, you know, movies and TV and radio, everybody's kind of going the same direction. And it's very difficult to swim against that current. You know, that's a, that's a hard thing that we have to battle with. But then probably one of the most difficult things that we fight against that we added last week was the whole hokey pokey kind of thing that we as uh, believers get into. You know, you put your left hand in, you put your left hand out, put your left hand in and you shake it all about. Do the hokey pokey and you turn yourself around. That's what it's all about, 
right? You know, so, you know, in the parking lot, you know, at church, you're like, oh, go ahead, you take the spot, you know, I'll go in the back and take it. But we get to the mall, and, you know, we're there first, and the little old lady's there second. <laughs> we pull right in there, you know? Uh, or, or we're at church, and, you know, we're, we're nice, and husband, wife, all huggy, and, you know, brother and sister, you're patient with each other. But you get home, <laughs> different situation, you know? And we, we do that, you know, at church is this way, or in our quiet time is this way, but other times at work or some other situation, it's different. That's the hokey pokey. We're in, we're out, we're back and forth, and we're usually just enough in that we feel comfortable and we're kind of like the other people around us. Well, I'm not any worse than him or her or him. And, and we feel comfortable with ourselves. And so as long as we're in as much as everybody else is in, we feel good. But what does it really matter? What does it really matter? And that's what, that's what Paul is talking about here in Ephesians. Now, if you remember, we're looking at the, this prayer that Paul has at the end of chapter 3. We've gone through 1, 2, and 3. And at the end of chapter 3, Paul is praying, and he's got these henna clauses. In the Greek, the word henna means so that, in order that. It's a purpose clause, a result clause. And there's, there's an order that he's going through, and you have to follow this order. And it ends with bringing glory to God. And we can't get to that last part of this thing he's praying without going through each of these phases. And so it's very important that we understand that. Now, we can't just jump in the middle or jump at the end. We have to start at the beginning and work our way through because it's a progression that he talks about. And so that's what we're seeing here. And so, he, like I said, last week we asked the question, what does it matter if we defeat our enemies? What, what, what does it matter? What, 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 what do we care? And Paul's going to answer that question. And the answer is this. Now, if you want to plot your notes, I kind of wrote out some things this time so you have that to look at later. But under uh, point one, where I say, why does it matter if we defeat our enemies? I say the answer is this. When we become a believer, we are no longer the only one living inside our body. But God dwells there with us. Now, that's the concept that Paul is talking about next, is that, you know, this, this body that we all have, this is just a house. You know, this isn't Brad. This is just the body that Brad lives in. It's like a house. You know, my soul and my spirit is housed inside of this body. And when we become a Christian, it's no longer just me in here. It's now me and God because God chooses to live within us. And this is found in a lot of different places in Scripture. John 14, 23, Jesus says this. He says, Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Isn't that amazing? That he comes and he lives within this body with me. The two of us are now together in this body. And this is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6.19, he says this, that we're no longer our own. 1 Corinthians 6.19 6, says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. Now, if we ask Christ to come into our life and to save us, and we think of that as maybe fire insurance. You know, I just, wanted, I just don't want to go to hell. Okay, that's not really what salvation is about. Because when we pray and ask Christ to come into our life and to enter a relationship, he actually does. He comes into our life. He comes into our body and he dwells in this body with me. And we're together. And so this body, I can't just do anything I want with it or you can't do anything you want because he's in there with you. And the two of you are together. And then we see in, our, in Ephesians, the book, the book we're going through, Ephesians 2.22, it says this. Now, now, remember this prayer. Paul says, uh, for this reason, I pray. And we, we would look back at what that reason was. And that reason was this, Ephesians 2.22. This is the reason Paul is praying this prayer at the end of Ephesians 3. He says, for this reason. Well, what reason, Paul? Well, if you go back, he's referring to Ephesians 2.22. In him, you also were being built together 
into a dwelling place for God by his spirit. See, we together are a dwelling place where God lives through his spirit. Okay? And then, then Paul goes on in Ephesians 3, and he's praying this prayer based on that verse. He, so he says in Ephesians 3.14, our passage that we're kind of going through right now, he says, for this reason, what reason? Well, we just read it. For the reason that because God dwells within us, for that reason, Paul says, I bow my knee before the Father, or I pray that he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Now why? Why does Paul pray that your inner self could be strengthened? Why? Is it just so we can be a good boy and good, good girl? Is, is that it? Is it just so we can obey the Bible and, and, and kind of be a little bit different than other people and you know, because God wants us to be a good boy or a good girl and, and be obe- No, no, that's not what Paul's saying. Now, those things might be true, but that's not Paul's point. Look at what he says. I pray that God will strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Why? So that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. So that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. So the best way to think about this is kind of like getting married, all right? You know, we're the, the bride of Christ. We actually do get married to, to, to Christ. And, and the, he, we're the bride and he's the, the bridegroom and we're going to actually, I guess, have a physical marriage someday, you know, when we get to heaven. But we are, in a sense, being married to Christ. And so it's a good way to think about it. So if you think about the single life, I mean, the single life is kind of cool, you know? I mean, you know, you guys, now you're under your parents, but as soon as you go to college, things are going to change a little bit. And you're going to get some more freedom. Well, guess what? Your free time is your free time. You can do whatever you want. Your Saturdays are your Saturdays. If you want to sleep all day, you can sleep all day. If you want to watch TV or play video games or go to the movies, you can do that, right? You know, and when we get older, we, we, we have to work, but we still have free time. And, you know, you can go on vacation wherever you want to go. You want to go to the beach, go to the beach. You want to go to the mountains, go to the mountains. You know, you're single. You can do whatever you want. No, you, there's no obligation to anybody. However, when you get married, eh, it's a little bit different. You know, because now you got someone there with you in the same house. So it may be that... Uh, like one of our kids, it may be that your room is just a wreck. I mean, there were times we literally, probably most of the time, we couldn't see the floor in one of our kids. Now, they're going to be here for Christmas, so don't ask them which one, because I'm not going to tell you which one. But it was such a mess. And if you want to do that, that's fine. But when you get married, your husband or wife might come in and say, uh, this, this isn't going to work. Not going to work here, okay? Or, or you may be, you know, maybe you're a girl and you like pastels and frilly pillows and little knickknacks around the room and things like that. And again, your husband's going to come and say, this isn't going to work either. As he's nailing up, you know, some football posters or pictures. He's got his golf clubs in the corner. He has maybe a stinky uniform thrown over here. You see, because now you're living together with someone else. Or maybe there's a single guy, you know, and he's got his little bachelor pad. He's got his, his couch laid out in front of this big screen TV where he watches football. And he's got a little, you know, one of those little fridges here with all the drinks and a little food tray here and a TV tray. And all day Saturday, he just kicks back and he watches football. He's got his drinks, he's got his food, and he calls his friends over. But one day he's smitten with this little missy and little missy comes and says, uh, this isn't going to work, you know. You can watch one football game a week, but this, no, okay? And the, the little TV's out in the trash, the TV tray's out in the trash, you know, because we're eating at the table. You know, the big screen TV is now a small screen TV over in the corner, and it changes. Why? Because you're now married, you see. You see, it, it changes when you choose to live with somebody, it's just the way it works. Now, as a newly married person, after a year or two, you can resist that. You can say, I'm sorry, but I'm not changing. 
And that will not end well for your relationship. It just won't. But if you choose to change, I can tell you, you're going to grow quite a bit. You're going to go from a self-centered, selfish life that everything's about me, myself, and what I want to someone who actually is a loving person who knows how to give to other people and to be in harmony with other people and to do things that maybe I don't want to do, but maybe, you know, she wants to do. And you grow and you mature. So that is what I believe is what we're talking about here with Christ. So look at what Paul says, point two there. It says, Paul prays for power to defeat our enemies so that Christ can dwell in our heart. Let me read it again. Ephesians 3, 16, 17. I pray that, you, that he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Why? So that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. Now, that's a little confusing, all right? It, it kind of sounds like Paul's talking about salvation there. I mean, was Christ not in their heart? He's praying that Christ would be able to dwell in them, their heart. You know, is he talking about the fact that, you know, playing the hokey pokey or an inconsistent life or a self-centered life is, is an unsaved life? It's a life without Christ? Well, well, no, he's not saying that. I mean, he has just spent Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 2, and, and most of chapter 3 all talking about everything we have in Christ. That we're in Christ, Christ is in us, that we're in the heavenly places, we have all the spiritual blessings. He has given us all the resources that we have. He just spent three chapters talking about everything we have as a believer in Christ. So clearly he's not talking about that. So... If he's not talking about salvation, what is he talking about? He's praying for the strength in our inner self. Why? So that Christ can dwell in us. Well, what does that mean then? Well, it has to do with the word dwell. If you look at that, that word in the Greek, it, it kind of expands a little bit. You'd have to use several words in English to say what it means in, in Greek. But it's made up of, of two Greek words. Um, it's made up of the word kata, which means down, and oikeo, which means to be in your house, to be at home. And then when you put those two together, just like in English, when you put a prefix on a word, it tends to intensify the word or add a little bit to the meaning. So when you put katoikeo together, kata and oikeo, you get to settle down and be at home, to really be at home, to feel at home. You know, sometimes you go off to college and you come back to home and it's just so good to be at home. And that's what he's saying. That's, that's what that word means. Paul is praying for inner strength that we can live a life so that Christ feels and can settle down and be at home within us. It, it's so important that that takes place. Because when our lives are not that way, then I guess the opposite is true. Christ does not dwell in the sense of feeling at home and being at home and settling down in us. And again, remember, we have this, these henna clauses. It's this, so that this happens, 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 so that we can bring glory to God. So if we don't have a life where Christ can dwell, settle down, and be at home in us, then we ultimately can't bring glory to God in the sense that God wants us to do that. So it's important that we understand how we create and have a life that, that Christ can feel at home within us. And the way we do that, uh, the next point there is that as we allow the Spirit, we looked at this the last two weeks, as we allow the Spirit to empower us and fill us, our heart becomes a place Christ can settle in and be at home. So, the, you know, the Holy Spirit is the one who helps us to develop a marriage type relationship with Christ. You know, as a single person, I don't know what, you know, what my wife is gonna be like. I don't know what she likes or doesn't like. You know, as a, as a spiritually single person, you know, all I know is what I like, my fleshly desires and the things that I want. But once I get saved, I still don't really know what Christ wants. It's not like I magically know these things. 
But that's the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And as we looked at last week, the Holy Spirit works through the Word of God to help us to understand the kind of life that God calls us to live. It, we saw, without going back and, and looking at it again, that as we study scripture, as we memorize scripture, as we meditate on scripture, we face a situation in our life and we're getting ready to act one way and the Holy Spirit says, no, 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 remember, remember this, we learned, this is how you respond. And we do that. It's the, the Holy Spirit uses the word of God to help guide us and direct us in our lives, and so that's what he does. You know, as a, as a spiritually single person, you know, I think things are important like uh, maybe, you know, watching videos or playing video games or watching TV, or maybe, you know, I think that work is really important and making it up the corporate ladder and being responsible and, you know, all, not that any of these things are wrong, it it's all has to do with doing things in a right proportion. Or maybe I feel like friends are important or hobbies or maybe I have a pet sin or a pet lust or a pet, you know, obsession. And, you know, all these things are in my life when I'm spiritually single. But when I become a Christian, the role of the Holy Spirit, he comes in in, in me and he begins to help me understand the kind of life that God calls me to live. And as I make those changes in my life, I have the life that Christ can feel at home and settle down and be at home in, and I kind of achieve that next step in that henna clause, and I can move on to the next part in that. So the question isn't, is Christ present in my life? I am I saved? That's not what Paul's getting at. What Paul is getting at is, is my life and is your life right now a place where Christ can settle down and be at home at? Or does he have to avoid this room and he has to avoid that room and can't go over there, can't go over there, and he's uncomfortable in all these, when he's at work, I gotta back over here. Boy, when he's in that situation, I, I, can't, be, I can't be present there. And when we're like that, Christ can't settle in and be at home. The, there's a, uh, uh, Robert Munger is a Presbyterian pastor and he, he uh, was teaching this passage and he thought, what is the best way to explain this? What is the best way to help present these, these truths? And he wrote a, a narrative, it's like a, a word picture to explain the, the principles. And I thought that's probably the, the best way to, to do that also is just, uh, let me just read this. So just kind of sit back and, and just imagine as I, as I read through the thing that he wrote here. And I think it, it really illustrates what, what Paul is getting at in Ephesians. So here's what he said. And, and I think there's, this is exactly what, what Paul is talking about here. He says, one evening I invited Jesus Christ into my heart and said to him, Lord, I want this heart of mine to be yours. I want you to settle down and be perfectly at home. Everything I have belongs to you. Come, let me show you around and introduce you to the various features of the house so you will be more comfortable and, you can be, and we can have a fuller fellowship together. He was very glad to come, of course, and happier still to be given a place in my heart. The first room we entered was the library, the place in my mind where I do a lot of thinking and receive thoughts and information through reading, TV, the internet, and more. As he began looking around at the various shows I watch, magazines I read, and inter internet sites I went to, I became uncomfortable. Strangely enough, I had not felt badly about these things before, at least not too badly. But now that he was there and looking right at these things, I was embarrassed. He also noticed the pictures on the wall, the imaginations and thoughts of my mind. All of a sudden, I realized some of them were also shameful. I turned to him and said, Master, I know this room needs a radical alteration. Will you help me make it what it ought to be to bring every thought into captivity to you? Surely, he said, I will gladly help you remove all that is not helpful, 
pure, good, and true, and help you replace them with scripture that you can meditate on throughout the day. As my thoughts became Christ-centered, the, the impure thoughts backed away, and I learned to control what I thought about. Well, from the library, we went into the dining room, the room of appetites and desires. I spent a fair amount of time in the dining room satisfying my wants and my desires. I said to him, this is a favorite room. I am quite sure you'll be pleased with what we serve. He sat at the table and asked, well, what's for dinner? Well, I said, my favorite dishes, the hopes of lots of money, nice vacations, stocks, a new car around the corner, and an early retirement. However, when the food was placed before him, he said nothing and didn't eat. I asked him if something was wrong, and he said, well, I have meat that I eat that you don't know about. My meat is to do the will of him who sent me. He looked at me again and said, if you want food that really satisfies you, seek the will of the Father, not your own pleasures, not your own desires, and not your own satisfaction. Seek to please me, and that food will satisfy you. And there at the table, he gave me a taste of doing God's will. Next, we walked into the living room. This room was rather intimate and comfortable. It had a fireplace, overstuffed chairs, a sofa, and a quiet atmosphere. He also seemed pleased with it. He said, this is indeed a delightful room. Let us come here often. It is secluded and quiet and we can fellowship together. He promised I will be here every morning. Meet me here and we will start the day together. But over time, my schedule got busy and made this more and more difficult. It was not that I didn't want to. I was just busy and too busy to spend time with him. At first, I shortened my time with him every day, but soon I began missing a day every now and then. Then it was two days in a row and every other week. And finally I realized I rarely spent time with him at all. I remember one morning when I was in a hurry, I passed the living room and the door was open. Looking in, I saw a fire in the fireplace and Jesus, he was sitting there. Suddenly in dismay, I thought to myself, oh my, he's my guest. I invited him into my life. He has come as Lord of my house, and yet here I am neglecting him. I turned and went in. With downcast glance, I said, Blessed Master, forgive me. Have you been here all these mornings? Yes, he said. I told you I would like to meet with you every morning. He said, I realize that you only really think of Bible study and prayer as factors in your own spiritual growth, but remember... This hour means something to me also. I love you and I have redeemed you at a great cost. I value your friendship. Please don't neglect this hour if only for my sake. Whatever else may be your desire, remember, I want your fellowship. At that moment, I realized that I also wanted to spend time with him and had simply let life reorder my priorities. So I recommitted to meet with him every morning. Next, we came to the playroom, the room where I unwind and relax. I actually tried to avoid this room and walk past it, but he stopped and asked about it. I was hoping to avoid that question. You know, there were certain fellowship, friendships, activities, and entertainment that I really wanted to keep for myself. Plus, I had a feeling that, well, you know, if he had a long, hard look, he would feel uncomfortable and not exactly at home. So I avoided the question and we just moved on. However, night after night, as I spent time in there without him, I realized that this was not right. I asked myself, what kind of a friend would deliberately leave another friend out of such an important room? 
So later I went up to talk it over with him. I said, Lord, I have learned my lesson. I can't have a good time any longer without you. From now on, we will do everything together. Then we went down into the playroom and he transformed it. He helped me replace fleshly forms of entertainment with those that brought real joy, real happiness, real satisfaction, new friends, new excitement, and new joys. There was just one more room, but I avoided that run altogether. We didn't even pass it. Even so, one day he came to me and said, there is a peculiar odor in this house. It smells like something is rotting and dead. As soon as he said this, I knew what he was talking about. The hall closet, where behind lock and key, I hid one or two of those little personal things that I knew were dead and rotting. They were things left over from, well, the old life. But I loved them. For a long time, I refused to acknowledge the smell. But one day, I finally did, and together, we mounted the stairs and headed up. With every step, the odor became stronger and stronger. He pointed to the door and said, there, it's in there. Something dead and rotten is in there. Well, I was angry. That's the only way I can put it. I was upset. I had given him access to the library, to the dining room, to the living room, to the playroom, and now he was asking me about this little two by four foot closet. I said to myself, that's my closet. This is too much. Am I not going to give him the key though? Well, he said, reading my thoughts, if you think that I'm going to stay up here on the second floor with this odor, you're mistaken. I will take my bed and go out on the back porch. I cannot stay up here any longer. Then, I, then he started down the stairs. When you've come to know and love Christ, the worst thing that can happen is to sense his fellowship retreating from you. I had to surrender. I'll give you the key. I'll give you the key, I shouted hesitantly, but you'll have to open the closet and clean it out yourself. I don't have the strength to do it, and I have tried to do it before. I know, he said. I know you've tried. Just give me the key. Just authorize me to take care of that closet and I will. So with trembling fingers, I passed the key to him. He took it from my hand, walked over to the door, opened it, entered it, took out all the rotting stuff and threw it away. Then he cleaned the closet and painted it, fixed it up and doing it all in a moment's time. Oh, what victory and release to have that dead thing out of my life. I only had to make my heart a place where Christ could settle down and be at home. Let's pray.